just as a review, uh, Genesis 12, we've seen the beginnings of the story of Abraham. At the, as of right now, he's being referred to Abram, and I'm just going to apologize now. I'm probably just going to keep saying Abraham. We know who he is. His name changes later. Spoiler alert. But that's, we're, we're speaking on Abraham, and I'm ca- catching myself saying Abraham instead of Abram, and I'm just going to not fight it. <laughs> but in the last chapter, we see, we, we're starting to really get into a picture of who the man, this man is, the father of the nation of Israel. And one of the first stories we really get to see from him is one of a failure of character. And I, I appreciate this because it's showing us that these great patriarchs of the faith were not perfect. And I, namely, in, throughout ch- chapter 12, we're seeing the story of Abraham was just promised this land and that his children would go on to become a great nation, numerous as, can't even count how many descendants they'll have. He receives this promise. He goes out to the land on faith of God's word, finds it, and as they're just getting established, a famine comes. And this is where we get an example of, I would think, something we can all relate to. You believe in God. You have faith in God. Trust him. But then something hard happens in your life. And then we see what Abraham did here, and that is he tried to bring about his own deliverance. His faith fell short, and he sought to make correct the problem instead of trusting in God to solve it for him. Trusting in God to show him the way through it. And in this, as he's arrived in the promised land, flees to Egypt. He puts himself in danger. He puts his wife, his family in danger. And is even rebuked by a pagan king. (laughs) Why would you lie about this? Get out of my country. And that's where we're picking up here in Genesis 13. So Abraham went up from Egypt to Negev, he and his wife and all that belonged to him, and Lot with him. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. He went on his journey from Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of what the altar which he had made there formerly, and there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. So what is the first thing we see now? We've seen this lapse in faith in trying to bring about his own deliverance in hard times. But what does Abraham do? We got through this. We got out alive. He corrected course. He got back on course. Instead of, woe is me, how horrible am I, how, how I failed God, I can't help it. I, I'm sorry, Lord, he, he didn't just have a pity party. He picked up and got back on course. We're seeing that, yes, we are human beings. We're not perfect. We're going to slip up. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to forget to turn to God for the answers. We're going to think that we know better. We think we have it figured out. And we will have failures. But what we're seeing here is a failure that almost costed him and his family's lives. Instead of having a pity party, he got back on course. What did God want him to do? Get to the promised land. Get to the land that he was promised by God. 
get over there, go, get back on course. That's exactly what he did. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks, herds, and tents, and the land could not sustain them while dwelling there, dwelling together, for the possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham, Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. So now we're back on course. We've corrected what we've done wrong. Back on course following God. Now we got another problem. Problem probably a lot of us can't relate to, but he's too rich and his nephew's too rich. Too many people working for us. Too much livestock. Too much gold and silver. The land can't handle it. Can't relate. But (laughs) they have this problem here. Both Lot's family and his people and Abram's family and his people, they got too much going on in the land they're trying to possess right now. And it's causing strife. It's causing arguments between, oh, it was our turn to have that field. And, oh, you you can't just take over this area. They're going back and forth fighting. So immediately we're seeing another opportunity to follow God's heart in this situation. Another problem presenting itself. How do we address it? So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Lot, we're family. We can't be having this going on. We can't have this bickering back and forth. That's not, that's not what we should have going on. And remember in the last verse there, we got the Canaanites and the Perizzites watching. The outside world is watching these people that claim to follow the one true God. How are we going to handle this situation? I think it's something we, we, can, we should try to keep in mind ourselves. The outside world is watching the people that, sw- that swear to follow the one true God. How do they handle Difficulties. How do they handle problems? How do they deal with what the world throws at them? I don't think it's just a coincidence that we're pointing out that these other nations are watching. You had one problem, Abram. And you choose to go about your own way and flee and try to handle it yourself. And that almost turned out horrible for you. Now, here's another problem. How do you handle it this time? So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between us. Verse 9, it is not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. If to the left, then then I'll go to the right. If to the right, then I will go to the left. We're not getting along together, our people. So here's what we need to do. This whole land's ours. God has promised it all to us. You pick a direction, I'll go the other one. We'll separate it out. No need to fight over territories here. Now, what I want to point out to this, though, is Abram didn't say, okay, I'm going this way, you go that way. Anyway, he didn't do that. He left his, the decision to Lot. And this is kind of a stroke of godly wisdom here. As much later we see in Philippians not, that we shouldn't turn to our own self-interest, but give consideration to others. So that's what Abram's doing right here. He's giving, saying, this is the the problem. Here's a solution. You take your pick. I ain't going to just immediately take the good spot or make make the immediate choice. You choose which way you want to go. And trust. He's trust now. Trusting God will carry him through whichever way this goes. Instead of immediately trying to go on his own wisdom of how to handle the situation. 
He's leaving it up to chance. He's leaving it up to God to guide it. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as, as you go to Zoar. Lot chose for himself the valley of Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they were separated from each, from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. So, Abram says, okay, we need to separate. This is much as obvious. Our people are fighting. So he says, Lot, I'm going to leave it to you. You pick which way you want to go. I'll go the opposite direction. Abram's trusting that however this goes, God's going to carry him through. Lot, on the other hand, says, really? <laughs> I can pick whatever land I want? Well, he took a look around. And was like, that looks like a great place to raise a herd. Lush, fertile valley of the Jordan. Looks just like what we saw in Egypt. It's fertile lands. I'm going to go that way. They got big cities there. It's well established already. That looks like the easy road. You're crazy, Abram, but I'm going that way. Lot went the more carnal route in this situation. He, he wasn't trusting in anything but his own judgment. His judgment says, I got herds, got fertile land. This is an easy choice. I'm going to go with it. And this is the thing here. Is often it, the easy choice seems like it's completely ob obvious. How could you turn away from it? No consideration of what God's leading in this. Lot never turned to God and said, which way should I go? So... Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities and the valleys, moved his tents as far as Sodom. We know a little bit about Sodom. <laughs> if you don't know anything about Sodom, now the men of Sodom were wicked, <laughs> exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. Lot chose Sodom. He went to the, the, the established city, the easy route. He went to the way that the flesh would say, this is obvious, go for it. And after they separated, we see that Sodom is in a great place. It's completely against God. Lot didn't take any of this into consideration. That wasn't his concern. His concern was earthly things, his material possessions. How am I going to handle the situation we got going on? I've been offered the gravy train prosperous area. Obviously, I must take it. A more modern example that might be more relatable is your job just offered you a huge promotion. Great salary. Give your company car. Pay, they'll pay for everything. All you got to do is live literally on the strip of Vegas. Now, the earthly mindset says everything's going to be great. Money, promotion, Living in a, basically a, a worldwide travel destination? Well, we're not taking into account. Vegas has no place for God when it comes to the Strip. <laughs> and we're going to see later on that this really does cost a lot. But after the separation, the Lord turns to Abram and tells him, take another look at the land. It doesn't matter where Lot went. I have promised you this. This will be yours. It will belong to your descendants forever. 
I, I believe that Abram understood that. He remembered God promised this. And now here we are looking. It's been pro- he's once again reaffirming the promises he's given to him. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also numbered. I don't know if you tried to count, but that's a lot. It's quite a bit. Innumerable, essentially. Arise. Walk about through the land, its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are in Hebron. And there he built an altar to the Lord. So after this strife, all this turmoil, Abram put more trust in God in this this instance. We're going to see that it was the wise choice. Trust in God. Trust in what he has to say. But I think it's too easy to just dismiss Lot's thinking here. I, I mean, in a practical sense, you've been promised basically prosperity. It's been handed to you. Why not take it? But when we don't take any, any consideration to what God has to say for, in the situation, what God's leading with, what his word would have for this situation, yeah, it seems like an obvious one. But what we're going to see and what we're going to find out is Lot's fleshly decision here, his fleshly gut reaction on the situation will cost him. Cost him greatly. Abram is still trusting in that promise, trusting in what has been given to him by God. And this time around, when he's faced with this trouble, this hard time, what seems like a, a roadblock in life, he's trusting in it, and it turns out it's going to be far greater than he can imagine. God will work in it. God has pro- made a promise, and he keeps it. He's going to continue on in this situation following God. He's going to put, we're going to see more and more often. He's going to put more and more faith. He's going to still have his hiccups. He's still going to have his times he trips up, but he's going to be blessed in this. And we keep seeing it over and over here. We can venture into 14 a little bit here. It came about in the in the days of Amphro, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elazar, and Shedalamar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, that they were made war with Barak, king of Sodom, and the Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of, of Adma, and Shemebar, king of Zoabim, and king of Bela, that is Zoar. I really didn't think I was going to be able to say all those. <laughs> all these came as allies to the valley of Sidim, that is the salt sea 12 years they had served Shedelamar but the 13th year they rebelled in the 14th year Shedelamar the king and the kings that were with him came and defeated Rephim the Ashtoreth Carnium and the Zuzim and Ham and Emmon and Shavat Kerathim and the Horites in their Mount Seir as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. <clears throat> Gotta get a drink after trying to do all that. And the Horat, <clears throat> then they turned back to, and came to Em Mishpath, that is Kedesh, and conquered all the countries of Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Asherm Tamar, and the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adam, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, came out, and they all and they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Sidim, against Shedelonar, king of Elam, and the title king of Goim, and the Emperor, king of Sinar, and the Ariat king of Elazar, four kings against five. Essentially, the entire region has gone to war against each other. It's, if this is the known world, we're in world war. 
<clears throat> there is plenty of going back and past and history and how all this works out, but essentially one of the greatest battles in the Old Testament history is going on. <laughs> now the valley of Sidim was full of tar pits and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and they fell in into them. But those who survived fled into the hill country. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food supply and departed. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed for he was living in Sodom. Great, lush land, great for raising a herd and is going to be prosperous and already great established cities. Sounds like it's going to be a great time. Easy road, we'll have it made. This is going to go great. And then all the region decided to send on Sodom and Gomorrah and basically level it. <laughs> Stealing all the gold, silver, all their supplies, and taking a few slaves, including Lot and his family. <laughs> they also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. Then a fugitive came and took, told Abram, the Hebrew, now he was living by the oaks of Mamre and the Amorite, brother of Eshkol and brother of Enar, and these were allies with Abram. So all this war had broken out. The city was just taken down, everything is stripped out of it that was worth carrying away, including Lot and his family and all their possessions, taken out. And if Abraham had a few friends on the inside who were able to get out of the city and come inform him that, hey, your nephew who took off to Sodom, well, now he's in the cage being hauled off. Informing him of what that all this was going on. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hoba, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. So basically, this Abraham's family has been attacked. They've been imprisoned. Few fugitives of the attack were able to inform him, and he said, okay, boys, let's go get them. 318 men, and if you actually plot out all these locations, an army that just took down a city was ran off by 318 men as far as 150 miles, they were tailing these guys. <laughs> yeah. They were wanderers. They really didn't even have an established place. They lived out of tents. They raised herds. And when he says trained men, the Hebrew actually means knew which way to hold a sword. <laughs> When it says train, basically they knew to stick them with the pointy end. <laughs> so he got everybody that was had any kind of comprehension of how to fight, 318, and ran off an army that just was successful in sieging a city. And won, and got his all their stuff back, and some, and his his nephew, and the women basically recovered everything that was lost. It doesn't explicitly say this in the text, but I think what we can see here is army attacks city, hey boys, let's get the, the rest of the guys together and go get our, our nephew. There's a lot of faith there. <laughs> There's a lot of trust that this is what's right to do. And so just kind of putting this in comprehension here is, you know, National Guard sieges the city, but they took one of your family members. You get everybody you know that can possibly travel and say, let's go get them. These guys didn't have real weapons. These guys didn't have any 
formal training. They were farm boys. And they're taking on a trained military. Just the level of faith that we see here. And we're seeing that God is still holding his promise here. God's promise was to Abraham and his descendants. Who is Lot? One of his descendants. His nephew. One of his family. God's promise was not just to Abraham. It was to his family. Where does that put us? If you're a child of God, you're a descendant of Abraham. If you're in Christ, Christ is a descendant of Abraham. These promises apply. He's given us a promised land. And I'm not even talking about the physical land in Israel here. He's given you a promise. A heavenly home. A heavenly kingdom. Heirs to the throne. Your royalty if you're in Christ. So I think what we need to focus on here is let's not worry about the piddly little things that's around you now. You've got bigger things to be looking to. Yes, the bills pile up. Yes, the bank account runs short. Yes, people get sick. Yes, times get hard. Yes, you ache. I'm tired. All these things come about. But have faith. Have trust in God that he will carry you through. Christ once told us that look at the lilies of the valley. Look how beautiful they are. They don't worry about anything. You are so much more important to him than that flower. The birds of the sky do not worry about anything. They are taken care of. Don't you think your heavenly father being more concerned with you, loving you far more, that he will not take care of you also? Obviously, I'm paraphrasing. I didn't memorize the verse exactly right now. But the point stands here is that you are his children. You are the ones he's concerned with. The things that seem so large to us right now will be nothing in the heavenly kingdom. Now, I'm not saying stop paying your bills or drop your insurance because you don't need it. God's going to take care of you. No, insurance will take care of many things. But don't sacrifice your health, your mental stability over these things. Don't live in fear of the what if or how am I going to get through this. God will take you through it. God will carry you through it. You are his child. He's going to take care of you. Think of this parent-child relationship. It's a very real thing between us and God. As a parent, I'm not going to let my son completely flounder and fail and end up dead on the street. I will step in before things get to a point that it can't get corrected. I'll let him learn from his mistakes. Sometimes i got to add a little extra to that mistake because what were you thinking? <laughs> but just as a parent will let their child make a mistake so they can learn, so will our Heavenly Father. He knows that things are going to come across that are going to challenge you. He's going to let you make a choice. Whether you make the wise one or the one that you thought was very wise, he's still going to be there on the other side to carry you through. But that doesn't negate our responsibility to turn to him for that guidance, to seek his wisdom. Ask and it will be given. When we 
pick up next week, we'll take another look at one of God's promises to Abraham, how he's going to reaffirm what his plan is for him and see where the next venture in Abraham's story goes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the lessons that you can show us and guide us through. We thank you that you're faithful and always there for us to turn to, to, to guide us, to give us wisdom in what we think are mighty, mighty decisions, but in the end, it's nothing for you to, that you can't handle. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for everybody that was here tonight, and I just pray for a safe trip home. In Jesus' name.